the life you gave Your body was broken Your love poured out Letting you die for me There on the cross You breathe your last As you were crucified Gave it all for me. Hallelujah, what a savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Yeah, you are. Hallelujah, King forever. And we thank you for the cross. See healed in darkness and lifeless lay The frame of the Father's Son in agony And He watched His only Son be sacrificed And He gave it all for me
you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Sing, but on that day. But on that day, what seemed as the darkest hour of violent hope, broke through and shook the ground. And as you rose, all the light of all the world was magnified. As you rose.
Jesus, we lift you high. Be lifted up, be lifted It all revolves. It all revolves around your throne. Who can know your glory? So high above, it's slain for us. You alone are worthy. And the praise is yours, and the praise is yours, you're the one we bow before, reigning over us as we lift you
the praise is yours. You're the one we bow before. Reigning over us as we lift you. Yes, Jesus, the praise is yours, Lord. We thank you, God, that you are here in our midst, present here at New Song Church, Lord. And God, I pray that you will just move and move in power throughout our church today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, New Song Church. You can go ahead and find your seats. I should probably say this because it's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Or I actually like the new name, Happy Singles Awareness Day. I like that name a little bit better. So if you would like to volunteer here or sign up for a small group, we have a digital card that you can fill out, and you can fill it out by texting NSE to 888-111. And if you've been hanging out here for a few weeks and are wondering, what's my next step here at New Song Church? We have a New Song 101 event coming up next Sunday following both services. It's a great opportunity to have any, if you have any questions about our church, to have those answered, meet our pastor, and just hear what, what this church is all about. So we're going to meet up... Um, in front up here next week following both services. We also have three ways to give back to the Lord. We have for tithes and offerings, we have a text to give option, which is you text a dollar amount to 84321. And we also have a drop off box in the back back there so you can drop off a cash or check or we also have an online option for that as well. A couple more announcements I have for you is we have our baptism class after both services today. We're going to meet up in the front right here, and that is a good way. So if you want to get baptized, we are going to be having our baptiz a baptism service next week. So if you want to get baptized, I encourage you to come to that class. We also have a marriage summit starting Thursday, February, tw February 25th for three weeks, and you can sign up for that by filling out our digital card. We also have a small group leadership summit coming up Sunday, February 21st at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary. And if it is your first or second time here, we would like to say welcome, and we would like to welcome you by offering you a free $5 Starbucks gift card on us, and you can receive that gift by filling out the connection card. But other than that, please welcome Pastor Taylor as he brings the word. Hey guys, good morning. Good to be with you. If you got a Bible, go ahead and open with me to Acts chapter two. You guys made it with all the snow. You're awesome. Folks at home, love you guys. We miss you. Glad you're hanging out with us too this morning. Uh, we're really, we're breaking into some awesome territory this morning, guys. I'm really excited about. Uh, uh, you know, Acts 2 really represents one of the major moments, in fact, in the entire Bible. This is, this chapter kind of brings us into one of those moments where it's like, this is a really, 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 really big deal. And uh, I'm really excited to spend some time here the next couple weeks. Some of this, you know, it, it's, we're going to love and be like all about. And then there's going to be other parts of Acts chapter two that we might feel a little bit uncomfortable with. Uh, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, who he is, what's he all about. We're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What does that even mean? Uh, how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How do you know if you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit? We're going to talk about tongues. Uh, you know, it, what is that? Is that still a thing today? Uh, what's the effect of the Holy Spirit resting on the church? Now, some of you are already confused. That's okay. Jesus is going to iron all of that out. But there's also a group of people in here watching online, potentially. You, you think you have God already figured out, right? Like, like, it's easy for us to think, man, this is how God works. And uh, Jesus is going to show up in Acts 2 and be like, yo, you have no idea. Okay, so I've been reading and reading and reading and reading Acts, guys, through and through and through and through the last couple of weeks. And God has shown up once again and shown me that he is so much greater uh, than I thought he was. And I believe that Jesus wants to rewire how we view uh, some stuff here the next couple of weeks. So I'm excited to dive into this uh, together. And also, I think there's people here Maybe you grew up in church, right? Uh, you know, like you, you, you like believe Acts 2 is a thing. You believe this actually happened in church history, uh, but you don't actually have faith to believe for the same type of experience in your own life. 
And uh, so Jesus is gonna press up against that today, I really believe, and say that this is something that he wants you to, in fact, live into, right? Maybe, maybe you're afraid to believe for this. Maybe you're afraid of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, afraid of really surrendering your life to the Holy Spirit, or at least it's something that you have never really actually mixed your faith with and believed God for. And, you know, I've been thinking about this specifically when we break into Acts 2 here. The book of Acts, it's either gonna do two things in our church. All right, you ready? Two things. There's only two options here, I really think. It's either gonna burn us to the ground or we come out on fire, okay? I really don't think there's any like middle gray area with the book of Acts. Yeah, we are coming out different, which I love, right? Because here, listen, man, I do not want to just manage a church. Like, I don't wanna just manage New Song Church and have a really awesome Sunday gathering and have a balanced budget at the end of the year. Those things are great, I love that. But dude, I want the power of God. Like, I want my life to count for something, man. I want our church to count for something. I want your life to count for something. Man, we've, we've seen God do amazing things as a church family the last several years. We have encountered Jesus. We've encountered Jesus in this room. We've encountered Jesus in the prayer room. We've encounter Jesus in our small groups. And what happens is when you encounter God, you do not go back to dead Christianity because you just, you just can't do it. And so that's what I'm believing for, that kind of reviving of the heart as we sit with some uh, pretty amazing scriptures this morning and next week. And uh, here's the thing, you know, before we jump in, you're probably gonna have a lot of questions, which is great, and I wanna make room for that. So I set up a phone number for you to actually text here. If you have any questions as we're going through Acts 2, you know, I say something, you're wondering about it, hey, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, this is gonna be kind of really an evangelicalism and non-denominational streams of Christianity. This isn't something that we talk about all the time, and I think that's really a bummer, and so we're going to be correcting that the next couple weeks. So if you have any questions, feel free to text me, and uh, we'll see about uh, making sure those get answered the next couple weeks or so. All right, so let's jump in, guys. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, jumping right in, says this, when the day of Pentecost, now Pentecost was a Jewish holiday that was celebrated once a year. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Now, the first thing that I want to you to learn about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that he is attracted to unity in the church. The Holy Spirit is a, he's, he's very attracted to unity. They're all together in one place, right? And this is what God is doing in our church family. He's calling us to, in the midst of all of the mess of our lives, all of the dysfunction, all of the failures, all of the issues, all of the problems that we have, he is looking for a people that are radically committed to one another. This is what it looks like to be a part of the church of Jesus. And in fact, in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying and he prays to the Father specifically that we would become perfectly one. That it's a ridiculous vision that Jesus has for us. He's not praying about, you know, when we die and go to heaven one day. He is contending, pleading the Father that right now we would become perfectly one. And here's the thing. Here's what I got to say, guys. Let's just be objective for a second. No wonder we are not seeing the power of God manifest at high levels. Right? You look at the book of Acts and these guys were committed, man. They were doing life together. They were committed in all of the dysfunction issues they had. They were together. They were fighting for one another. Uh, and this is the, the, the Bible's view of Christian community. Now, here's the problem is we have been culturalized by Western individualism. I heard somebody say this recently, defining, defining what that actually means. And he says, in the West, we have really big privacy fences and really small dinner tables. That's a problem. And, and what we did is we brought that into the church and we still have these really big privacy fences. I mean, think about it. How many people in this room know your issues, man? That's the point. How many people in this church, this is your church, right? If you're, you're here right now, we love you. We care for you. We're so glad you're here. How many people in this church actually know your weaknesses, what you're struggling with, you know, like where you're prone to sin? How many people know how to be praying for you right now, as well as know your strengths, right? This is what we do. We have really big privacy fences. I want you to stay at an arm's length. Don't really come near my life and all my stuff, really. That's for me. You stay over there. And we have really small dining tables. Tables. Uh, it, you know, we're actually, I'm so stoked. My family, Marissa and I are going to uh, California coming up uh, in March. We're going to get some sun with my sister and brother-in-law. Pray for us. That'll be interesting. Um, 
It's going to be awesome. I'm excited for it. But, uh, you know, we're staying at this Airbnb and all you guys are just going to be suffering here in the rain. It's going to be awesome. And I'm going to be sitting poolside. It's going to be great. Okay. So uh, just to rub it in a little bit. All right. I'm pretty pumped about it. So, but you, you, we're looking at this Airbnb. It's supposed to fit 10 people, right? Like it's a decent sized Airbnb and the dinner table, I kid you not, has two chairs. It's like, what are you supposed to do with that? But that's exactly us guys. That's the point. We don't know how to dine with one another, how to experience life with one another. Acts chapter two, verse 46, at the end of chapter two, when the church, Peter's gonna preach and 3,000 people are gonna be born again. And it, it talks about how this community organized themselves. And it says, daily they broke bread in their homes together. Right? This is a community of people nobody had a point to prove to anybody else. We've got people that are just in love with Jesus and in love with each other. And the Holy Spirit is very attracted to that kind of unity. That's why one of our statements of purpose is, you know, authentic Christian community. Meaning we don't want you to just show up and warm a seat on Sunday morning or watch online and uh, wear, wear a, a, like a mask, figuratively speaking, you know, where nobody knows what's really happening in your life. Right? We don't want you to do that. We want you connected to other Jesus followers where you're knowing and you're being known because if you're not, that's a fake Christianity, man. That's not actually real. And to think that I could be a Christian without Christian community, that's not a real thing. And in COVID season, this is massive, right? Because a lot of you, and this is a heartbreak, heartbreaking reality for a lot of people at our church, is you suffered greatly this last year and it's your fault because you chose the pride route and you chose to not engage in Christian community. And that's the reality. And maybe you're here, you're not a Christian, you're watching online, dude, jump in. We've got space for you here. So glad you're hanging out with us. And this is why small groups are so important, guys. Shameless plug here for about another 120 seconds, okay? They're so important. God is doing amazing things in our small group. We are always looking for more opportunities to build community. And in fact, uh, this, okay, this could either be really awesome or really lame, but I got an email this last week about uh, a uh, church men's softball league. That's what I'm saying, you know? So here's, here's the thing. If you're, if you're feeling about, you know, beating on some other churches locally, talk to me and let's get a couple teams together because we would absolutely destroy this league. I think it'd be awesome, right? But the point is, is we're trying to do life together. And for some of you men that are isolated, that's gonna be a great opportunity for you to get more involved. So let me know about that. Uh, I think we've got half of a team put together already. So we're just gonna go for this thing and see what happens. Let me know if you're interested. Okay, so let's keep reading in verses two through four, then we're gonna stop there. And it says this, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. That's really important. Every one of them. And they were all, circle that word all, filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So, all right, let's intro the Holy Spirit for a second because this is, this is kind of his entrance into main stage here in the book of Acts. We're really seeing the Holy Spirit up front and center for the first time. Who is the Holy Spirit? Uh, there's this massive, that massive question is in front of us right now. Who actually is the Holy Spirit? Let's talk about this for a second. What you need to understand is the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a ghost. He's not something from Mythbusters or uh, Ghostbusters or Casper, the friendly ghost or anything like that, right? He's a person who can be known and who can be felt and experienced and loved and grieved. This is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. He is God. He's the spirit of the father. He's the spirit of Jesus. In Romans chapter eight, verse nine, Paul says this, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God, father dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, who's Jesus, he does not belong to him. So Christianity holds to a Trinitarian view of God, meaning that God is one. He is, there is only one God, but he exists eternally as three distinct persons, Father, Son, who's Jesus, and Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing, man. This is why there is absolutely no reason for you to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. I know a lot of Christians that are, they're, they're kind of, they're uh, trepidatious, if that's the right word to use right there, or we're, we're kind of fearful of the Holy Spirit and really surrendering to his authority and control and power in our lives because we have such a wrong view of who he is. I'm telling you, man, he's the spirit of the father. 
He's the spirit of Jesus. That means when you look at Jesus, you see his character, right? That's the character of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I am gentle and I'm lowly of heart. This is the characteristic also of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, he in fact taught a lot on the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, verse seven, look at this verse. Jesus says this, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, speaking of the Holy Spirit, but if I go, I will send him to you. Now, what's Jesus saying? This is crazy. This is a ridiculous statement of Jesus. He's saying, hey guys, I know it's been pretty cool us hanging out together and being so close, but it's actually advantageous to you that I go away, speaking of his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, because when Jesus, he's saying, when I get to the right hand of the Father, right, Acts 1, then I'm gonna receive the Holy Spirit and I'm gonna pour him out on you and that's actually gonna be a better thing for you than if you and I were walking in the flesh together, all right? That's crazy, why? Because if you were to interact with Jesus as Peter, James, and John or anybody from the first century, you had to interact with him as a person confined to a specific place and now what he does when he sends the Holy Spirit is he actually fills you with his person, with his power and with his presence, That's what it means to receive the Holy Spirit. You become a dwelling place for the spirit of Jesus. There's no more separation. He becomes closer to you than the very breath that's in your lungs. This is what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is all over the Bible. We don't just get to Acts chapter two and then he finally shows up, right? He's all over the Bible. You can back all the way up to the creation story and it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters at the dawn of creation. He's all throughout the Old Testament. He's prophesying, he's speaking, he's imparting supernatural gifts and abilities. He shows up at the temple after Solomon dedicates the temple and the fire falls and fills the temple, right? This is the Holy Spirit rushing into the temple which is kind of like a modern day church back then, which would be awesome to actually have that happen here, which is what we're believing for. And so and everybody fell face down and they began to worship God when that happened. He's all over the place. And so here is the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter two. He's not falling on Mount Sinai or on the temple anymore. He's falling on people. He's falling on people now in Acts chapter two. And in the New Testament, the role of the Holy Spirit is very comprehensive, and I wanna actually show this to you here. Uh, let's get this list of uh, the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Look at this. This is, this is just a glimpse into what the role of the Holy Spirit in the context of the church, the life of the believer in the world is. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 26, that the Spirit will lead you into all truth. First John 2, 27 talks about how you don't have any need of anyone to teach you because the Holy Spirit is gonna come and teach you. That's every preacher's favorite verse, right? But the, the, he's not, John isn't saying don't ever listen to preaching or don't show up in church. It's in the context of false teachers and being able to discern that. He's saying, listen, man, all All of that should be supplemental. Like Holy Spirit is your teacher. He he comes to actually teach you. And that's the reality of what we believe here, that this space, guys, what's happening right here, this is meant to be supplemental to your faith. What we're doing right now, this is meant to be supplemental, not the main course. This is really important and it's critical. We have to gather and come underneath the authority of the word together. It's a great opportunity for us to correct wrong ideas and false teaching, but this is meant to be supplemental. So what happens, and this is really annoying, uh, I talk to people all the time that are leaving a church, coming here or whatever, you know, they're frustrated, they're confused, they're burnt out, discouraged, uh, church hurt them, whatever. They say stuff like this. You know, I, I left because I, wa- I just wasn't getting fed. You ever heard that? Have you ever said that, bro? You know, I just, I just wasn't getting fed. Like the preaching wasn't doing it for me. It just wasn't, it wasn't really nourishing my spiritual self. Like think about how weird that image is, guys. Like what do you want me to do? You want me to bust out like the Gerber, like baby food with the plastic spoon and like scoop it and like, okay, open up. Here comes the choo-choo. Like, right? That's crazy. That doesn't make any sense. That's not real. Feed yourself. 
Seriously, go sit at the feet of Jesus and learn how to be taught by the Holy Spirit because he wants to speak to you, man. He wants to, here's what happens. When you do that, when you stay connected to the voice and the leadership and the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life, what happens, all of a sudden he begins to speak to you and you come here and we're talking about the exact same thing. It's crazy how this happens, man. Have you ever had that? You're wrestling through something, you're praying about something, you're studying something, then you show up on Sunday and then it's like we're preaching on it. That's exactly like, it's just expounding on the question that you had this previous week. What's going on? Same spirit that's in you is in me. And in fact, I had several people before we transitioned over to the book of Acts uh, several weeks ago who, before I even made the announcement, what happened was that the Holy Spirit started prompting them at our church to begin studying the book of Acts. And so when I came out, I was like, hey guys, we're gonna pivot here. Jesus is leading us in this direction for a little bit. They were like, whoa, that's what God has been speaking to me. I've been already studying this thing, right? What's the point? We're one with each other. One, the same spirit in you is in me. And this is meant to be an incredible encouragement to you and supplemental to you coming underneath the teaching of the Holy Spirit in your life. Of course, God is gonna teach you through his word. Do not get weird and chuck your Bible and then just go think that everything that comes to your head is the teaching and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That's how you get really weird, okay? So let's just throw that out there as a caveat. Um, now, the other thing that the Holy Spirit does is he reveals Jesus. I love this. He comes to make Jesus real to your heart. He comes to take the wonder and the beauty and the character and the nature and the worth of Jesus. And he comes to, he loves to declare the glory of Jesus to your heart, to fill your heart with awe of who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit comes to fill you with power to be a witness for Jesus. That's Acts chapter one, verse eight. I mean, think about this, okay? We've got Peter. Let's just isolate him for a second again. Uh, one of Jesus's original followers, very present in the New Testament. He denied he knew Jesus three times when Jesus was being uh, tried and about to be crucified and killed. He denied that he knew Jesus three times. He's a complete coward, total coward. Wouldn't say I know him three times. And now Acts 2 rolls around and he's about to get up and preach in front of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Boldly, man, could you imagine getting up and preaching in front of thousands and thousands of people, right? Like that's, that, that's some supernatural boldness, especially for a guy that just denied he knew Jesus, but here he's about to do it and 3,000 people are gonna get born again. What happened? He experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He had crazy boldness. I actually heard this story recently. I love this, hearing these stories of people at our church. Um, Somebody the last couple of weeks was going through a, uh, a coffee drive through and she was going through getting coffee and wasn't really thinking of anything about it. And then all of a sudden she just felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit that said, hey, tip this girl really well and tell her that I love, tell, you know, the girl that I love her, that Jesus loves her. And so she's like, okay, immediately uncomfortable, right? Just as everybody gets like, well, okay, I just wanted coffee and now I got to do this, you know? Whatever, so she gets up there, ends up getting her order, and she's like, okay, Lord, I'm just gonna do this in faith, tips her really well, gives her the tip, and then she kind of looks at her, and then she's like, hey, I just feel like you just need to hear this, that Jesus really loves you today. This barista starts weeping just because somebody tipped her really well and told her that Jesus loved her. What was happening? God was working on her heart already, and this was a major encouragement and confirmation to her of the fact like, hey, God is real. He sees you. He loves you. Here's some extra cash because I know stuff is really hard right now, and oh, by the way, Jesus sees your life, and he loves you, and it wrecked her, okay? And it was a drive through and so she's like got cars behind her, so she's like, okay, Bye, and had to like leave, you know, like all awkwardly, but it was, I love it. It's like a Holy Spirit drive-by, man. That's awesome. But what happened? Why is that so important? I mean, we had somebody that was willing to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a witness for Jesus, and God showed up in an amazing way and really touched somebody's life. I love that. The Holy Spirit comes to pour out the love of God into our hearts. Romans 5 verse 5 talks about how God pours out his Spirit into our hearts, and he brings the love of God to bear upon us. And you know, the baptism of the Spirit, guys, I really believe, is a baptism in love. It's a baptism in the love of God. That's Romans 5.5, 5. go read it, it's right there. It's God taking his love and pouring it out on 
your heart and making it real in your life. So let me ask you the question, man. I love that, because today's Valentine's Day. Do you think about that? I love, this is so cool. It's like we've never preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit before, and here we are on Valentine's Day talking about the great love gift of God for us to be filled with his spirit. So I've got a lot of faith that God's gonna move and do some great stuff this morning. Let me ask you a question, though. How real is God's love for you right now? Like, how real is it? Is it just an intellectual thing or is this wrecking your life? Like, are your emotions being moved? Are you being moved because of the reality of the fact that Jesus loves you, that the Father loves you, that the Spirit loves you, that God loves you enough to hop up on a cross and take your sin and die in your place? raised to life so that you by faith in him and his finished work can have newness of life, right? He's interceding for you at the right hand of the Father right now, Jesus is. Like, is your heart actually being moved by the reality of the love of Jesus for your life? Or is it just an intellectual thing? Right, because that's gonna show you like, okay, where am I at as, as far as regard to my relationship with the Holy Spirit? Because when you experience the love of God tangibly, personally, for yourself, everything changes. And I'm gonna share an awesome testimony about that at the end of the message. The Holy Spirit comes to empower you to walk in holiness, right? This is the idea. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this in a couple minutes, but you, you cannot become like Jesus by your own. Christianity is not about behavior modification, trying really hard to be a good enough person to beat sin. I gotta white knuckle it. I gotta grip my teeth and try hard. The Holy Spirit comes to supernaturally make you become a different kind of person. He comes to conform you to the image of Jesus. This is a supernatural thing that happens when God takes up residence on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit makes intercession. He's praying for you and through you, Romans 8, 26. He imparts gifts for ministry. Every single born-again Christian has at least one supernaturally imparted gift that the Holy Spirit has sovereignly chosen for your life for the sake of building up the body and establishing the kingdom of God in your city and uh, the spheres of influence that God has given you. The Holy Spirit comes to strengthen you. Are you experiencing God strengthening you right now? This was a year where we needed the strength of God. Isaiah talks about the spirit of might, that he is the spirit of might. Are you experiencing the strength of God? Paul talks about how in my weakness, the strength of Jesus is made perfect. This is what the Holy Spirit comes to do, to come and put steel in your spine to face whatever issues and trials and and problems and uh, tribulations come at you in life. He comes to give you strength. He's a comforter. Jesus says that in John chapter 14, verse 26. You can also translate the word helper as comforter or as advocate. He's your advocate. He's not here to condemn you or to judge you, but to help you comes to comfort you. And I love this idea of a comforter because what does that mean? That you're going to be uncomfortable. If we're doing the Christian walk right, you are going to be uncomfortable. Jesus wouldn't send you a comforter if it wasn't going to be uncomfortable. Cross bearing is not comfortable, ladies and gentlemen. Just want to throw that out there. We need the comfort of the Holy Spirit and he comes to bring it to bear on our lives. Now, Acts 2, obviously this is a crazy supernatural moment, right? There's wind, there's there's, it's, 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 Luke says it's like wind, it's like fire. There's people speaking in different languages. And he says that they were all filled with the spirit, which is the fulfillment of what Jesus promised in Acts 1 verse 5 when he said, you will be baptized in the spirit not many days from now. What I want you to recognize again, I have to say this, you have to get this. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a promise for every single follower of Jesus. This is a promise. This is something that Jesus promises. Acts 1 verse 5. This is promised for you and for me. This isn't something for a few, for, you know, a few really spiritual people. This is God's plan for every single born again child of God. Uh, and you could see that in Acts chapter 2. There was 120 people in the room. Every single one of them experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, the weird guy that only shows up every once in a while in the back he got it too, okay? This was literally that person in your small group that all they do is talk all of the time and drives you crazy. They got it too. This was everybody in the upper room was baptized with the Holy Spirit. A couple of you didn't laugh because you're that person, so maybe reevaluate. <laughs> I'm just kidding, kind of. Okay, so 
And in fact, the whole New Testament, new covenant that Jesus came to establish, it's predicated on the Holy Spirit actually taking up residence on the inside of you. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 through 27. God says this, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. That's like the whole new covenant promise, guys, is that God is gonna send his spirit to actually take up residence on the inside of us and cause us to become a different kind of person, to take our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh that are pliable in the hands of God. He's creating, he's, he's making us to be a different kind of person. Now, Here's something you may not know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is you can actually be born again and not have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. This happens three times in the book of Acts. Let me show you one. Acts chapter 19, verses one through six. I don't know if we have the full thing, so you can just jump there with me. Acts 19, Paul is preaching in Ephesus. Apollos came through. A lot of people are believing. And we're just gonna start in verse one because I need you to see this. It happened though while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, okay? So these are followers of Jesus. And he said to them, to the disciples, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Why is he asking the question? It's because he, it was possible that they didn't actually receive the Holy Spirit when they believed in Jesus. And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. I love that. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. This is water baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, verse six, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying, okay? What's the point? They believed in Jesus, legit, you know, born again followers of Jesus. These are Christians. These are disciples, Luke calls them. Uh, and they hadn't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Paul shows up, did you receive this? Why? Because he's concerned about it. He's like, this has to happen. These details, guys, that Luke puts in here, keep in mind, he's a physician, he's a doctor. Every single one of them is very, very important. The point is, is you can be born again without actually experiencing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you need this, man. That's what I'm trying to say. You need this. Listen, man, it's so, it's, it just breaks my heart to see so many Christians trying so hard to live a life that's pleasing to God, trying so hard to overcome sin and addiction. And you know, that's, here's the thing. You gotta kill sin or it's gonna be killing you. I totally get that. But if you are not going to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, good luck, dude. Seriously, good luck. When I got filled with the Holy Spirit, Every single addiction I had broke off of me in a moment. Everything changed. I tried to break free, man, for years and years and years, and nothing worked until God moved on me and filled me with his spirit. This is what's available for you. You can be born again without experiencing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we wanna fix that, and we're gonna start today. But let me ask you, let's ask this question. Okay, so how do I know if I've experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Maybe you're wondering that. Uh, the first thing I would say is, are you experiencing that list that I mentioned? Can we get that list up of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament? Are you experiencing that, right, number one? But let's nuance this a little bit more. Are you experiencing life transformation? Are you becoming a different kind of person? Galatians 5, Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit and how, you know, it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, right? That when God comes and puts his Spirit in you, fruit comes. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, you know, like you've never seen a branch that's tried hard to bear fruit. It just happens as a result of the branch being connected to the tree. And Jesus is saying here in Galatians 5, hey guys, this is exactly how it works. You want to know how to bear fruit? It's the fruit of the Spirit, meaning it's not the fruit of Taylor. You get filled with his Spirit, and God supernaturally makes you into becoming a different kind of person. So look at your life for a second. Like, are you becoming somebody different? Are, 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 are you a resentful, angry, bitter individual with a hard heart? You know, you're struggling with sin all the time. 
right? Like you're just, you keep going back to the thing. Your affections aren't changing. Your heart isn't changing. You're hostile. You're trying really hard to manage your behavior. Is that you? Paul says the fruit of the spirit is love. And when God takes up residence, you're gonna grow in love for Jesus and love for other people just as a byproduct of you being connected to him. This is normal. This is natural. Uh, you know, Jesus says the Holy Spirit, he's gonna come to convict the world of sin also, right? He's the Holy Spirit. He's a Holy Spirit. Uh, he's holy, right? And so are you experiencing conviction for sin in your life or you just kind of keep messing around and doing everything and then your conscience doesn't even get pricked about it? That would be evidence of the fact that the Holy Spirit has been quenched in your life or you've never actually really received him in the first place. So he's gonna produce holiness in us. Are you experiencing a growing desire to worship Jesus? In Acts chapter two, verse 11, uh, it says that, uh, let's get that verse. I think this is uh, Acts 2, 11. We hear them, so they're speaking in tongues in Acts 2, and the people around the upper room say that we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Everybody in the upper room, they're praising God. They're worshiping God. They're talking about how amazing God is. Are you experiencing a greater desire to worship Jesus? Because with the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he makes the goodness and the love of God so real in your life that you can't help but worship. That's the reality. So, okay, we got some more stuff to get to. Let's keep plowing through. What's this whole speaking in tongues thing about? Do you guys realize how impossible this is to do in like 30, 40 minutes? Okay, so let's talk about tongues for a second, all right? What's this whole tongues thing about? I wanna make a couple of observations to you because we get all jacked up on this too. Notice in Acts 2 verse four, everybody is speaking in tongues. There isn't one person that is not, there, there's some sort of physical manifestation evidencing the fact that every single person in the upper room was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And we can draw by implication that every single one of them was speaking in tongues. And this happens several other times in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 46 says this, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Verse 46, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Right? So same thing. Acts chapter 19. Again, Paul lays his hand. We just read this a couple minutes ago. He lays their hands on them and every single one of them speaks in tongues and they're prophesying. Okay? We don't know if some were prophesying and some were speaking in tongues, but the reality is, is there was some sort of physical manifestation that happened that evidenced the fact that they were actually baptized by the Holy Spirit. And the point is, is that this is normal, guys, throughout the entire book of Acts. This is normal. This continues to happen. And Paul in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse five, look at what he says. I want you all to speak in tongues. Now, what I want you to realize about that, a couple of things, that word tongues right there is glossa in the Greek. It's the same exact word that happens in Acts chapter two. And he's saying, I want you all to speak in tongues. Here's the deal. That isn't Paul. That is Jesus. That is the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul to a church, also to us vicariously through them. I want you all to speak in tongues. For, so for those of you that don't believe in this stuff, you need to wrestle that verse to the ground, man. Any view that you have on tongues in the Bible, it can't contradict what's going on here and what Paul is saying. I want you all to speak in tongues. The point is, is God gonna tell you to desire to want something that he doesn't plan on giving you? No, Acts, or 1 Corinthians 14 verse one says that earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. It's in context of the gift of tongues and prophecy. God's saying, I want you to earnestly desire this stuff. Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. And Paul, again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 18, look at this. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, right? So he's saying there is a power here that is very relevant to my life and to my ministry, and I recognize the, how, advan like, the, like, how advantageous this is to me. This isn't just blubbering stuff that doesn't make any sense. He's like, I thank God that I pray in tongues more than all of you. He's like, you think you pray in tongues more than me? You suck, dude, okay? I, I pray in tongues more than you, right? Like he's willing to get in an arguing match with people. He's like, yeah, you think you're legit? All right, I prayed in tongues 10 hours yesterday, okay? So he's literally saying, this is an advantage. This is something to be wanted and something to be desired. How you doing? You doing okay? Yeah. Now, here's the thing. You can block this in your life. 
you can absolutely shut down the move of God in your life by a few things. Let's talk about this. Pride. Oh, that's weird. Ugh. That makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> you believe a dead guy rose back to life. Are you kidding? And ascended and flew up to heaven. Are you joking? And this is hard for you to like, but are you serious? This makes you uncomfortable? Okay. Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And this makes you uncomfortable. All right. Okay. You're a hypocrite. All right. Okay. So we've got the, the, the pride thing, unbelief. This isn't a thing, you know? Tongues, baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's too crazy, I don't believe it. Or how about this one, fear. Fear will shut this down in your life. You know, I'm scared of it. And I get that, man. Listen, I, I totally, I can level with you. If you fit in any of those categories, that was me, okay? And specifically the fear thing, like I, I was scared of it. Like, I don't, this doesn't make any sense to me. And in fact, I'm gonna tell you actually my story about uh, when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and uh, my experience with tongues in a couple minutes. We'll get there. There's a cliffhanger. Hang on. But let me give you two arguments that people constantly make, consistently make against what we're talking about, the baptism of the Spirit and uh, supernatural gifts, including the gift of tongues. Two arguments against. People say the gifts uh, of the Spirit and uh, you know the Holy Spirit baptism, it was a thing that God did in Acts because we needed it to establish the church. We needed it. To which I always say, did they need it more than we do? Listen, guys, the church, we're not really winning in culture right now. We are just as desperate for the Spirit of God to take possession of the church, to baptize us in fire, to impart spiritual gifts than we ever have been. That's the reality. Second, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse eight, Paul says specifically that tongues and prophecy will cease. You know, and so, so cessationists, this view that the gifts of the spirit have ceased, they say, see right here, the gifts are going to cease. They're gonna stop happening. But keep reading, dude, verse 10. What is Paul saying? He says when it's gonna happen. He says when the perfect comes, then they're going to cease. Here's my question. Has the perfect come? Do you look around and you see perfection in the world, in your life, in this church, for God's sakes, right? Like, do you see it? No. The perfect has not come. He's talking about when Jesus comes back and he ushers in the kingdom age to come. That's what he's talking about. Let me give you a couple of testimonies, okay? Uh, mine and then one from a few days ago and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, first experience I ever had with speaking in tongues, uh, I was actually at a youth, youth camp and um, you know, like there was this guy who was speaking, I was in middle school and me and my buddies were there and he was like, uh, you know, you young guys, you're called to be warriors for Jesus. Just about as like cliche as you could possibly imagine. He's like, okay, so if, if, you, if you feel a call to be a warrior for Jesus, come forward. So me and all my buddies were like, yeah, I wanna, yeah. I want to be a warrior for Jesus. So we go up front and we're chilling there and the guy's like praying over us. And all of a sudden, this guy who's like, you know, 5'4", 250 pounds of like just stocky muscle and this deep voice, like you can't even imagine. He's just going up behind us and he's just hitting people on the back and he's speaking in tongues and it's just like so intense. It's like, felt like the room was shaking when he was talking, okay? And so he comes up behind me, speaking, like, bam, he hits me, and I'm like, whoa, that was the craziest thing. That was the first time I encountered uh, speaking in tongues. But after that, when I got born again, uh, when I was 20, 19, 20, I ended up, I'd never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit before, and I ended up at a Russian youth meeting of all places over in paradise. And uh, I was there and there was like 30 or 40 of us in the room. No idea how we ended up there, but we did. And it was awesome. And I'm so thankful for it. And, um, you know, the, the youth pastor's chilling there. He's talking about stuff. And uh, he's, there's just kind of like a calm of like 10 seconds. And then all of a sudden, this really deep Russian voice. He's like, okay, everybody, go. And then all of a sudden, every single person in the room falls on their face, starts speaking in tongues and weeping. And I'm chilling there like, what is going on, right? Like, I am freaked out. I'm like, this is insane, and I'm getting offended in my heart. I'm like, there's no way this is real. There's no way this is legit. I'm about getting ready to walk out because I couldn't even believe what I was seeing. There's no way that was real. And so I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I just sense the Holy Spirit say to me, are you willing to humble your heart and receive what I want to give you right now? And I was like, oh, okay, all right, sure. So I get down on my knees with everybody else. The guy He's on his knees. He's crawling over to me on his knees. And uh, he gets up to me. He's like, hey, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I'm like, no, but I want it. 
I wanted it. So he lays his hands on me and he prays and I was filled with the Holy Spirit. My entire body started trembling. I didn't speak in tongues right there, but I experienced a supernatural manifestation where there was no doubt of the fact that I had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues came a week later than that. Uh, just when I was in the prayer room with Jesus, it just happened, just kind of flew out. And that's oftentimes how this goes as well. Um, but so that's, that's a bit of my, my experience with this. It's surprise, cat's out of the bag. I speak in tongues. And in fact, so does our entire leadership here. So uh, there's that. But if, that's, if that makes you uncomfortable, <laughs> if that makes you uncomfortable, go to the Bible, man. Like you cannot argue that this is still a thing for today. You have to torch your Bible to be able to do that, as Pastor Steve always famously used to said. say. Let me give you a, uh, a, just a, a, an awesome testimony from a few days ago. Somebody at our church, I was with him in my office, and uh, it's just crazy what God is doing in our church, guys. I'm telling you, there's rumblings of the movement of the Holy Spirit in our church. It's amazing. I'm seeing things that I don't think I've ever seen before at our church as far as the level of where God is moving right now. And uh, this was one of those moments. And so I'm sitting with this guy in my office, just had a crazy year, really walked away from Jesus and got into all this stuff and drugs and whatever and walked away from the Lord. And uh, he's, he's coming back. And so we're sitting in my office and we're just talking about all this stuff. And he's vomiting this last year out to me and I'm sitting with him. And... Um, you know, we're just talking. I'm like, dude, God is obviously after you. Like, this is obviously a moment in your life where Jesus is saying, you need to give everything to me, right? So I just asked him, like, what's keeping you from doing that right now? And he's like, I guess nothing, you know? Let's, this last year didn't work, right? And so he, he's sitting there, and so we just start, we start praying, and, you know, I pray for him for a little bit, and then I'm just like, dude, why don't you just start talking to Jesus? And so he just, he starts praying, and he's just like, Jesus, I'm just, I'm tired of running from you, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of going after all of this stuff that isn't you. I want to give you everything again. And all of a sudden, he just starts weeping, like just ugly crying, okay? That's how you know it's legit. Like there's like nice crying, and then there's ugly baptism in the Holy Spirit crying. And this was really ugly snotting baptism in the Holy Spirit crying. And it's because Jesus is just loving on this guy. He's just loving on him. And all of a sudden, and this is where this is going to get a little crazy. And it was for me, believe me, I'm sitting there and I'm like, Wow, I was not expecting that, okay? So we're sitting there. This is a guy that grew up in church, guys. We're sitting in my office. God is loving on him. He's getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Tongues start flying out of this guy like I have never heard before in my entire life. He was speaking a perfectly fluent and articulate language that I've never heard before. This wasn't just like a couple syllables. This was like, there is no way that you can possibly make this up. Do you see that in the Bible? Yes. Should we expect that today? Is there any good reason to believe that that should not be happening today? Absolutely not. And if you have something, talk to me, please. I would love to show you that you're wrong on this issue because I love you. <laughs> so here he is, man. He's just weeping and just praising God, loving Jesus. And we come out of this thing. It probably lasted about a, a, a half an hour, and I had him write me his experience, and listen, listen to what he says. These are his words. He said, I could feel Jesus getting closer and closer to me when we were praying until he was right in front of me, his forehead pressed to mine and his hand around the back of my neck. I whispered softly that I was done fighting it. I was sick and tired of being so close to the promises of goodness that I knew he had for me and not being able to grasp it because I hadn't fully given myself over. With the final phrase, I gave up what I had been holding on to for so long. Texted me the next day and he said, I actually understand what people are talking about. Like there is literally no better place than at the Lord's feet. I've been listening to worship all morning and I actually get it, like the whole principle of how amazing God is and I didn't understand until yesterday and it just makes so much sense. This is why you need the Holy Spirit. Grew up in church. He heard all the sermons. He knew all the Bible verses. When did everything change? when he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, lights came on. You can think you understand, but if your life doesn't change, you do not understand. 
God's love is not something to be intellectual. Paul prays in Ephesians that we would come to know. That word know is talking about practically through personal experience. The love of Jesus that surpasses all understanding. How are you doing? How do I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Let's talk about this. John chapter seven, verse 37 through 39. Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Verse 39. Do we have verse 39? Now this he said about the spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. How does Jesus say to receive the Holy Spirit? You come to him with a thirst. Jesus, I'm thirsty. And he says, those who believe, meaning this isn't something that you work for. This isn't something that you, you know, can earn. This is something to be received by faith as a gift of grace, just like your salvation, just like forgiveness for sin. This is what Jesus, how he gives the Holy Spirit. Um, you have to want it, man. Come to me, all who are thirsty. The clear pattern of the book of Acts also is the laying on of hands, where someone who has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit lays hands on somebody who hasn't yet and prays a prayer of faith for them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the clear pattern. And in fact, you get over, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, Acts 19, Acts 10, several other moments, those verses that we've already gone over today. Acts 10, there wasn't laying on of hands, excuse me. Acts 19 is specifically there. You can read that. I've got some more verses if you'd like it later. When you get over to Hebrews chapter six, verse one, uh, this is really interesting where the writer of Hebrews says, therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. He's talking about foundational doctrine. Like this is Christianity 101. Repentance, so this idea of turning from sin and to Jesus. All right, next verse, do we have that one? I might have screwed this up. Okay, so basically he goes on to uh, uh, the laying on of hands. He includes in this verse also, he talks about the perfect. Thank you, Ben, you're a hero. Um, nope, that's not it. Appreciate the try though, bro. Uh, so he talks about the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, all very basic Christian doctrine, right? Water baptism is in there, very basic Christian doctrine. He puts the laying on of hands right there in Hebrews 6. This is something that we don't talk about, right? But this is the clear pattern of how the baptism of the Holy Spirit happened in the book of Acts as people experience the laying on of hands. Now we can go to the baptism of the Spirit slide here. The laying on of hands in the New Testament was used to impart the Holy Spirit, was used to impart spiritual gifts, was used to uh, he the healing of the sick. Jesus says that in March, Mark 16, and also commissioning into different ministry assignments. Take a picture of that and go and read those later. Now, here's the thing also. There's no formula for this, guys. We get really religious and we like to say this is exactly how God is gonna work every single time. You know, you gotta be water baptized and then you can get filled with the Spirit. Acts 10 shows up and is like, eh. Before they were water baptized, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Or you have to speak in tongues when you experience the water baptism or when you experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts 19, they were prophesying. It doesn't say they all just spoke in tongues. It kind of seems to be like some of them were prophesying, right? So whenever we want to say, this is how it always works, you're wrong. Uh, you can only be baptized in the Holy Spirit once. You're also wrong. Acts chapter four, the same group of people that are baptized in the Holy Spirit from Acts two, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit again. Paul, Ephesians chapter five, verse 16 says, be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Same word, filled. Here, Acts chapter two, same thing. Be continually filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Now, let me bring this in for a landing. Here's my point. You need this in your life we need this in our church. Stop running from God. Some of you have been running from Jesus. And I'm not even necessarily just talking about baptism and the Holy Spirit stuff. I'm, I mean, you, you're just running. Your heart is hard. You're shut off to God. Come back today, man. Jesus loves you so much. You need to give him your entire life. Some of you have been resistant to surrendering your life to the Holy Spirit. And I wanna encourage you, man. Just give everything over today. If God wants to give you something, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. He's good things for you. Trust him. So what we're gonna do is uh, I'm gonna actually invite the prayer team up. If we can get our elders up front over to my left, that would be great, guys. You can just come on up and get ready. And uh, I'm gonna pray for us. And then I'm just gonna invite you, like, you know, like this is what we see in Acts. 
Let's just do the Bible, guys. The laying on of hands to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you're thirsty, you, you're like, man, I want that. I don't get it. Come with all your questions, all your doubts, whatever. We're just gonna lay hands on you and pray and believe God for something in your life if that's you. Uh, let's pray. Why don't you stand with me? Jesus, we love you. Lord, we covered some big stuff today. And uh, I'm just excited to wrestle through this as a church community. And God, we want to be a people that are absolutely full of the spirit of Jesus. We need it. Our church needs it. Bellingham needs it. And so Jesus, we just say, here we are. Come and fill us. We surrender everything to you, God. I pray if there's anybody here that needs to give their life to Jesus watching online, that they would surrender wholeheartedly to this great God of love who loves them enough to take a cross, to take those Roman nails, to die their death, to raise to newness of life so they could have eternal life, forgiveness from their sin and reconciliation to the God of the universe. Lord, I pray that you would bless us and lead us into a future being full of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, if we can pray, come on up. We'd love to do that. Otherwise, have a great week and remember to be kind to those that God has placed around you. We'll see you next Sunday.